So, go west, young man. You ever heard that one? <laughs> yeah, some say Horace Greeley. Actually, I did a little digging around that, and I found before Horace Greeley, it was John B. L. Soule who wrote in an editorial in 1851 in the Terre Haute Express. For those of you who are Californians, Terre Haute is back, back east in Indiana. <laughs> in that middle ground, you know, that you don't know about between the two coasts, where I'm from. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and he wrote in that the full quote is, go west, young man, and grow up with your country. So this was all about manifest destiny. This was about progress, moving west to develop in the outer. There was a painting in 1871 done by John Gast, or 1872, I think it is, and this is it. And it's um, in the figure in the middle, she, they're moving west. Everybody's moving west, right? And you can see different forms of transportation. And the figure in the middle is known as Columbia. She was the embodiment of the spirit of America before the Statue of Liberty. And uh, you can see she's got, she's got a book in one arm, which is the knowledge, the idea of further knowledge of development. And interestingly enough, here she is, this goddess of light who's levitating above the ground, and she's stringing what she's got, a coil there in a string, is she's st stringing an electrical cord across the United States <laughs> on telephone poles. Now, I think she probably has a higher calling, don't you? <laughs> I mean, she's enormous. She's a goddess. She's levitating. She is the god goddess of light. And so, too, the manifest destiny idea, the progress of America, is not just about outer technological development, but maybe, well, not maybe, much more so, much more deeply. It's the manifest destiny of the soul. And that's the journey that we're on in this series. This is the Four Shield series, our second week. And last week, we visited the South Shield, the shield of the child. It's summertime, it's play, it's the body and sensuality and sexuality. Oh, what fun, don't we want to be children for the rest of our lives? Yes, many of us do. And that's the whole thing about the wheel, is that it's meant to be a holistic picture of the human divine being. We can move, usually we do move from one shield to the next, from the south to the west, to the north, to the east. Sometimes we move across the map, though, as you'll see today. As we move to this western shield, we're also going to draw from the east, very much like Manifest Destiny was, coming from the east, the spirit of light. Light is the east. And coming then to the west, to a soulful place, a place of the unknown, it's rugged territory, it's earthy, it's unknown. There are caves there, there are places and things you can trip over. There might be fighting, there might be death. It's a, it's a grand adventure when we go deep into the West. The West is the shield that is represented by the adolescent. Yes, it can be moody. <laughs> It can be uncertain because we're both child and becoming adult, and it's that in-between transition. This shield is known as the fall shield. And what is fall? What, do, what is falling in the fall? But, you know, the trees losing their leaves and falling into nakedness, the days losing light and falling into darkness, the transition of life itself, and all transitions really marked very deeply by this shield, by this western direction, by the sunset and um, the earthiness of the shield and, again, the adolescence. So this is where we are in part two, entering the western shield, moving west and, uh, and, and embracing the ideas of fall or autumn, times of transition. So Stephen Foster is the co-author with his wife, Meredith Little, of the four shields of human sacred initiation, which is the base that we're using. But it's really not so much, they did write a book, but it's not so much about the book that the teachings are alive in their work as they bring people through rites of passage and wilderness fast through the School of Lost Borders. Stephen has transitioned off into the East, um, but Meredith continues on the work. And, um, and they were my teachers of this work, this kind of initiation that um, has been such a... Um, it's really filled out my spiritual journey in a really important way, and that's why I've wanted to share this with you. 
And the Unity teachings has been such, such an important part of my path. And along came then this other piece. And it feels like they just fit together just right for me. So, so it's part of that wholeness, that idea of soulfulness. And that's why the West is soul and the East is spirit. And we can't be all spirit all the time because we're also an embodied soul. And so that's why this holistic path is so important to get all the pieces together so that we can truly be the divine human that we've come here to be. So Stephen says this about the fall shield. He says, in order to be healthy, humans must negotiate the passage from summer to winter. This passage is crucial. Without it, there will be no survival. See, we wouldn't get to survive the winters if we don't initiate ourselves through the fall. This child, he says, most, I'm sorry, the child must be initiated in order for the people to become enlightened. So this fall one, if there's anyone that has a little bit more weight, it's almost this one, even though it's a balanced wheel, because it's so crucial that this passage happen. And you know, in our world today, it's happening, whether we intentionally as responsible elders initiate our youth or not, they are being initiated. And I want to share with you this poem. It's based on March for Our Lives. And it's by Alison Letterman, an Oakland poet. And it's called The New Breed for Emma Gonzalez and the other student activists. I see her on TV screaming into a microphone her head is shaved, and she is beautiful, and 17. And her high school has just been shot up. She's had to walk by friends lying in their own blood, her teacher bleeding out. And she's my daughter, the one I never had. And she's your daughter, and she's everyone's daughter. And she's her own woman in the fullness of her young fire. Calling BS on the politicians who take money from the gun makers. Tears rain down her face and she doesn't stop shouting. She doesn't apologize. She keeps calling them out. All of them, all of us who didn't do enough to stop this thing. And you can see the gray faces of those who have always held power, contort, utterly baffled, to face this new breed of young woman, not silky, not compliant, not caring if they call her a ten or a troll. And she cries, but she doesn't stop yelling truth into the microphone, though her voice is raw and shaking and the Florida sun is molten brass. I'm 3,000 miles away, and I'm thinking now how Neruda said that the blood of the children ran through the streets without fuss, like children's blood. Only now she is, and they are, raising a fuss shouting down the walls of Jericho. And it's not that we, the road-weary travelers, have been given the all-clear exactly, but our shoulders let down a little, and we breathe from a deeper place. And we say to each other, well, it looks like the baton may be passing. In these next runners, they are fleet as thought fiery as stars, and we take another breath, and we say to each other, the baton has been passed, and we set off running hard behind them. Yeah. <laughs> so when we enter the fall shield as adults, we enter it both for our own soulful understanding but also there is that reflection of eldership, you know, the baton passing, the holding, the space. And if uninitiated adults did not care for the children, they must initiate themselves through dark, horrifying experiences. And that's just 
how our society continues to evolve around the wheel. The good news is we get to make choices of how to both nurture our youth through this important passage and nurture ourselves and each other through it as we go round and round and round the wheel and across the wheel. So it's important work. You can see how crucial it is when Stephen says it's crucial. It's cr this phase is so important. And it's one that we may, as Eastern folks, try to bypass. You know, as my teacher Robert Brummett used to say, the 23rd Psalm does not say, it says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It does not say I pitch a tent, you know? <laughs> So you don't have to wallow in it, and that's a, big, that's a big part of why we don't want to go in to the darkness, right? Because we're afraid we're going to get just sucked into it and just never come out, right? You ever fear that? If you start crying, you're never going to stop. You're just going to cry a river until it just drowns you. <laughs> or you're, you know, and when we are in grief, it sometimes feels that way, doesn't it? And if you are in grief, bless you. You are in this very rich, rich, rich time of the Western Shield. So don't try to hop over it. Don't try to walk around it. And no, you don't have to pitch a tent in it either. Just curl up. Just allow yourself to be in it, in that cave-like, womb-like place. That's what the invitation is of the Western Shield. Step into the cave. Be not afraid of the darkness or be afraid. <laughs> It's okay, but just step in. It's the entering of the West Shield that's so crucial. It's the threshold of the shield that is so important because so many of us will get to the threshold and we'll want to run the other way. And we can hide under our spirituality and say, well, we're just affirming it all away, but that's not the real deal. And we all know it. <laughs> and our soul will call us on it as it calls us in the collective to look. As the shadow arises in the collective, it keeps showing us, the threshold is here, enter it. The threshold's over here. Here's another tragedy. There's another threshold, another. When will you all enter the West? <laughs> That's the call. That's the spiritual call. It's the whisper of the soul. Adam and Eve really begin this Western initiation for us, this fall shield initiation, all the way back to Genesis in the very beginning. Remember that God said the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, interestingly enough, and there he put man who he had formed from the dearth, the earth, or the dearth, <laughs> no, the earth. And there was an initiation then for Adam and Eve who are just coming into embodiment, right? The first man, the first woman, childlike in their innocence. They live in this place called Eden. It's a paradise, right? Everything is perfect. But the problem with paradise in that way is after a while it gets a bit ho-hum, right? There's no conflict, there's no contrast, there's no passion really because everything is perfect and we're taken care of at all times. And the human in us, the soul in us, longs for more. And that was Eve's longing that we can give thanks to. Eve's desire to reach for that tree of knowledge to know more, for the wisdom of the soul to eat of that forbidden fruit from the first bite that initiates us right into the West. And that's, of course, as we know what happened. So the fall, we understand, not as the Orthodox Church would tell us as some kind of sinful, horrible thing that we did and then were punished for, but the fall is like fall. You know, the falling light, it's the descent, but it's the descent into the depths of who we are. It's the descent into the soulful place of who we are. So if spirit is like this, the soul is the deeper tone. It's the harmony that we need, right? to have the song in its fullness, in its roundness. And that's what we're called into then in the fall. So, so of course, we know in the story of Adam and Eve, you know, God is, is, the big word is anthropomorphized, which means personified, essentially. So God is, you know, sort of, I imagine, storming, you know, big and storming through the garden and says, you know, you can eat of any of the trees, the fruits of any of the trees in this paradise, except for the tree of knowledge. 
Now, has anybody ever told a child you can do anything except this? <laughs> Guess what they're going to think about day and night. Yeah. I remember when my dad took me to the basement, into the dark recesses behind the furnace, and said, never turn this switch on. <laughs> I think I was five. It was like less than 24 hours. Flip. Yeah. <laughs> It got very hot on that, uh, in our house on that summer day in, in Michigan. But that's the way it goes, right? So there's Eve, you know, thinking about this and thinking, and, and she's even been told, if we eat of it, we're going to die. But the longing is that deep. The call of the soul is that strong. It's who we've come to be as divine human beings. We can't just have one-fourth of the pie. Well, we can, but we will be truncated in our development. We will be shortchanging ourselves in the allness of who we've come to be. And so it is thank God for Eve's reach, you know? Thank God for that initial human that said, no, I want to know. I want to eat of the tree of knowledge, and I want to know good and evil like God does. And so it is that bite that initiates then into both good and evil. And out of Eden, Eden is sort of at that level of innocence. It's sort of like the movie Pleasantville. Anybody see that? Yeah, so everything is sort of picture perfect, but it's flat, right? So it's sort of, yeah, it's lovely and it's wonderful, but hmm, something's missing, you know? And so that's a part of, of what happens in the so-called fall, the fall, the descent, into the fall shield, quite literally. It's curiosity and bravery that we take up when we move from the south to the west, or even across the wheel from the east to the west. And so, of course, we know the consequences in the story, right? Adam and Eve are banished from the garden. And so, quite literally, if you think about it, if you're hanging out in the east and you're told, get out, you're going to go west, right? <laughs> And so when you step out west, and Adam and Eve did so, and they turned around because they probably thought, oh, maybe we should just go back where it's safe. And what did they find? The gate is guarded. We're told there is a cherubim and a spinning sword of fire that's guarding that gate. Basically, you ain't getting back until you go and initiate yourselves further because you decided to go this direction. <laughs> and so off they go into the south and the west. And so that is the go west, young man and young woman, and grow up. That is the mantra of this coming into the fall. It's a grow up kind of thing on every level, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, as a, as a responsible adult and eventually an elder. This is our journey to be taken. And so the call of growing up then allows us to open to what this journey can be for us, what it can offer us in the West. What are the gifts of the West? As Stephen says, this fall passage is crucial. Well, why is it so crucial? Because when we move through the fall, when we go with the, the soul's longing, we meet up with our own sacred wounds. We meet up with our core beliefs. And that's why we don't really want to go there. You know, the things that we really need to learn, the crucial lessons. And so it's in the fall that we meet and move through our sacred wounds. So then we get to the north as the adult, we're ready to serve in a very real way, not just a sort of surface kind of understanding. And so it is through the initiation, through the darkness, through the passage, through the womb-like, the cave-like experience, of, of this western shield, this fall shield, that we are eventually then rebirthed. And so this is what helps us in facing the dark. If you're going through a time of depression or darkness, or that's, you're no stranger to that, then you're no stranger to the fall shield. You're no stranger to the west. You've been there before. And maybe for you, the lesson might be not to stay there, but to find the light, find the tunnel, Find the gift, find the other side of the birth canal, so to speak, so that you may emerge fully initiated as an adult and ready to really serve with your gifts. So it is a really a passage of finding our gifts in a way, finding our gifts through the wound. Anybody ever hear of the wounded healer? 
Yeah, so the concept of the wounded healer is that you can't really be an effective healer if you haven't yourself gone through some kind of wounding. And who alive as a human being has not experienced some kind of wounding? I mean, it's part of the, the path, isn't it? And so it is through the pain that we learn. And we, again, don't have to stay there. We don't have to suffer in it. But we must meet it and greet it, embrace it, move through it. So that's the call that we're up to. So it's good news for those of you who are familiar or currently going through maybe a darker time, a dark night of the soul even, a time of um, aridity of your spiritual practices, don't feel like they're really working for you, or some new entryway. It's, it's a great, you're, you're in the right place at the right time. And for those of you who are, are hanging out more in the East, it's probably daunting news if you're not hanging out in the deeper level of the East, but in the more surface level of the East, that's saying, well, I'll just, this too shall pass, I'll affirm it away, it's all good, no big deal, I'm better, I'm moving on, you know, all the stuff that we say. And we encourage each other to do, because we don't want to face our Western shield. <laughs> and so it's, it's that, so it's sort of daunting news, because to learn, oh, for the people to be enlightened, they must go through the crucial passage of the West. But take heart, because there's light, and there's gifts, and there's goodness to be found there. Harry Potter told us so. <laughs> For those of you who are familiar with Harry Potter, Harry Potter in the Deathly Hollows was the first movie outside the walls of Hogwarts School of Wizardry and Witches. And in Hogwarts School of Wizardry, Wizardry and Witches, and it, there was magic, right? All the kids had their own different magical gifts, Harry being the main character who's really uh, initiating himself, oftentimes through many of these different stages. And in the very beginning of this movie, the first one outside the walls, it's very dark. It begins very dark. You can tell the false shield is raining in this, in this film. And so the very beginning, there's... there's murder, and there's darkness, there's death. It's called the Deathly Hollows, right? And one of the first things that happens is uh, Harry's owl, Hedwig, dies. And his snowy owl, the white owl, the picture of the, the, the east, right? The snowy owl who sees all things, dies. And it's symbolic of the fact that she herself, or he, he himself, now can see in the dark like an owl. And so he's given that gift of being able to see in the dark. And later in the film, the three friends, the trio of teenagers that are the main characters, it's Harry and Hermione and Ron. They're, they're all best friends. But in this initiation, in this turn of events, in this Deathly Hollows, it's Ron who must face his sacred wound. You see, he's in love with Hermione, and he thinks she loves Harry. And oh, how painful that is, right? And they hang out together. And so over and over, he has to face this sense of inadequacy. She loves him more. She doesn't love me. She doesn't love me back. I am not lovable, which is that train wreck that we go on, right, when we begin with this kind of idea in relationship. And it's young Ron, this teenager, who has to deal with that. So as they are entering this journey of the West, the film has opened. They're far into their journey, and, and Ron is facing this he turns around and goes back to his parents' house. <laughs> and so this is what we may be tempted to do, right? Run and hide, turn away, I don't want to be here. Run screaming back to the place where we have a sense of safety. So in the South, it would be, of course, mom and dad and home. And in the East, it would be that fatherly God that's walking through the garden, right? <laughs> but either way, the West is saying, no, you must become your own mother and father. And Ron is a little afraid of that and a little afraid of this woundedness that he feels around love, and so he goes back. But it is the soul's whisper that brings him back again into the West once he reaches his childhood home. And it's Hermione. He hears Hermione whispering. And so he comes back again, and he has this epic adventure, of course, right? It's a movie. It's the, and it's the hero's journey story told over and over again, or the heroine's journey as well. And so in the, in the film then, uh, the magic that Ron has had is that he ha has a magic of light. And he thinks that the magic is just to be able to turn the lights on and off. 
He has no idea what the magic of light, this gift that he has is, and it will never be known to its fullness unless he passes through the shield. And so he turns back and he starts to learn as he's enter entering the darkness about the light. And that the light is something he can merge with, that he's one with, that he can travel through time and space in the light, just like us. That we are one with that light and we don't learn about that gift until we enter the darker places, the shadow, if you will. And so as he enters then in, and begins to recognize his gift, he turns into a deer, a spirit deer, spirit form of a deer. And Harry sees the deer and follows the deer, knowing the deer is taking them where they need to go to overcome the evil that they are uh, coming up against. And he follows the deer to this pond, Godric's Hollow, where this pond is. And in the pond is Godric Gryffindor's sword. It's a sword of truth, the sword of light. Not much unlike that sword, that fiery sword that's spinning outside the eastern gate of Eden. And so it's that that we want. We want to come back around the wheel with a wholeness and a oneness and an understanding and take up the sword of truth. And that's exactly what Harry is finding here deep in the recesses of the soul, in the darkness, in the cave, in his place of, of woundedness. And that Ron too, the two of them are together finding. So Harry plunges in, he gets the sword, and Godric, by the, by the way, means he who rules with God. And he grabs the sword, and Ron helps him get out because he gets stuck. You know, this is a great epic story. And then, and then Harry yells to Ron because Harry has the wisdom that sees in the dark, and he can see what needs to be done here so that they can fully initiate out of this into the north. And he says to Ron, you must crush the whole crux. I love that. Like the whole crux of the thing, right? Here it is. You must crush the whole crux, and the whole crux is the soul fragment of darkness. And so it is that Ron is now, he's basically saying, Ron, you have to face your sacred wound. You'll never get to the wholeness, the sword of truth, the fullness of your light. You won't get to use it out there in, in the north unless you crush the last fragment, fragrant, fragments. <laughs> of the soul's darkness. And so that's when Ron has to face it. You know, he has to say, oh, Harmony doesn't love me. She loves Harry. I love her. I love her really deeply. I feel really badly. I'm very sad. I'm very sad she's not returning it. What if no one ever does? What if I'm unlovable? And he has to be with that for a minute before he recognizes the full light that he is, the full love itself that he is, the self-love and the self-acceptance, which is really a key lesson typically in this shield. And so if any of you have ever had relationship experiences where the lesson was self-love and self-acceptance or long periods of being single and wanting to be in a relationship and that you had to learn again and again how to love yourself, Anybody else been down this journey besides me? <laughs> Good. <laughs> so this is a great gift that is given. As Ron has the courage and the curiosity, which is really what we need to really enter the shield, courage and curiosity. The courage to cross the threshold and then to say, huh, what's going on in here? What is it that my soul is calling me to? What is it that my heart is feeling? What is it that I am in right now and I can honor right now. And then you don't have to go digging around in the psyche. You don't have to make this shield happen. It just kind of happens. Things come our way and then we embrace it. That's the key, is embracing it, stepping in, stepping through, allowing ourselves to be initiated. And it's, it's usually scary. I'm going to tell you the truth. For most of us, it's scary. I went on a, um, oh, wow, I'm going really long. Okay, I'll tell you about that next week. <laughs> so, yeah, 
the fall, when the fall flag flies, because you think about these shields, they're kind of like flags. And when that fall flag flies and we've come through, you know, it's never a surrender flag. It's like a triumphant flag. It's a flag that says, I know who I am. I know who I am in an authentic way. I know who my soul is. I know what my gifts are. And I can't wait to emerge into the north and give them. That's the gift we want to give ourselves. And it's the gift we want to give our young people as they move through these just difficult teenage years to be able to tell them, no, you can do it. You can move through that. You have to go alone, honey. You know, that's the hard part. Hard part for the parents too. You know, you got to go alone through this passage, but I'm totally here with you. I'm, my presence is here. God's presence is here. Peace is with you. Love is with you. And just move toward the light and sit and curl up and allow yourself to be in it and, and really allow the light to come to you because it will. And then notice it, see it, embrace it, feel the woundedness and find the truth, the sword of truth in it. And that's where we blossom from there. So let's just have a prayer to close out. Beloved spirit that is the essence of who we are, we merge with that knowing. We merge with a knowing that wherever we go, God is because we are divine. And we know the fullness of that divinity because of this earthy walk, this beautiful gift that we have been given to reach with desire for that knowledge that we want to have, that wisdom, that deep understanding. Thank you, Spirit, for continuing to remind us of who we are, to show us who we are at depth. We walk through that threshold. We cross over that threshold of fear, and we walk with faith into the dark, knowing that we too, like Harry Potter, have eyes that can see in the dark. We too, like the snowy owl, can see deep into the dark. We too, like Ron in Harry Potter, have a gift of light, and we open to that gift. We open to the self-love and the self-acceptance, and we say, thank you, God, for this experience. Although I was once scared, I am now filled with greater faith than I could have ever had greater gifts than I would have ever had to give. And so we usher our children through this passage and we usher the children within ourselves. And so it is. Thank you, God. Amen.